This is Thinking in Public, a program dedicated to intelligent conversation about frontline theological and cultural issues with the people who are shaping them. I'm Albert Muller, your host and president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. Hadley Arcus is the founder and director of the James Wilson Institute on Natural Rights and the American Founding. After earning his PhD from the University of Chicago, Professor Arcus began a 50-year-long teaching career at Amherst College, where he served as the Edward Ney Professor of Jurisprudence. In addition to his teaching, Professor Arcus has been a sought-after voice on issues of American legal philosophy, American history, constitutionalism. He's written for outlets like the Wall Street Journal, NASA Review, and the journal First Things. He's the author of eight books, but it's his most recent book, Mere Natural Law, that is the topic of our conversation today. Hadley Arcus has been a conversation partner for me through his books for a long time. Professor Arcus, welcome today to Thinking in Public. Oh, Reverend Nala, thanks so much for having me in. I'm, I'm so touched by it. I just can't believe you've been reading my books all, all these years. And that was such a heartfelt meeting in Miami when I first met you. You had a picture together. It's Thanks for having me in. It's so good to be here with you. Well, I, I'm, uh, I'm really, really thrilled with this because uh, it's one thing to have a conversation with a man through his books. Uh, it's another thing to have a conversation uh, in, in person, and in this case, eventually in public. The occasion is your most recent book, Near Natural Law, Originalism, and the Anchoring Truths of the Constitution. Now, I want us to have a great conversation about that, but I'm really uh, very intent upon asking you to kind of trace your intellectual pilgrimage a bit for us, because I, I, I want to set, uh, set the table for the conversation about this most recent book. Well, I think it began at the University of Chicago. I was drawn by Hans Markenthal, but Leo Strauss was there the great Leo Strauss. And it's amazing that we I saw the first, you've heard of Strauss. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that, those first moments in his class, who's there? Young seminarians, retired gray-haired men from the service, young aggressive Jewish kids from Chicago. What do these people have in common? They're all standing against the currents of relativism. Right. Work in the co- and, and and the appeal was to, of course, the Bible and to the Greek classics, it was those two sources. Well, I thought Strauss was well over my head, and it was just as um, Socrates was said to have brought philosophy down out of the clouds to bear on questions of practical judgment. It was the great Harry Jaffa with his writings on Lincoln who brought Strauss out of the clouds for me, and it was discovering. A, of moral truths, how and necessary truths, uh, not relative to, to the culture, and how we kind of persistently drawn to that. And so that got me, that brought me into the course at Amherst that called Political Obligations that led to First Things, the book. And everything else I've done emanated from that book, you know, with Beyond the Constitution, I was trying to show how judges in the course of things are compelled to look beyond the text to those principles that were there before the text. The principles that the founders knew were there before the text, the founders the principles they drew upon. And the founders also understood that those principles would be there even if there were no text. Yes. So that became kind of, that became my vocation in a way. So I just kept applying it. To, to, I guess the point was, Albert, to show what would these cases look like? if we view them through a different lens, through the lens of the natural world, that we had access to genuine truths, to moral truths. And we came out and when we found them, we realized we're doing more than declaring what we've discovered in this tribe of Americans. You know, Professor, the average American, I think, uh, thinks about thinking uh, only episodically. But uh, insofar as the, the average American thinks about thinking, there's an awareness that there is a, a basic shift in uh, e- even in our lifetimes towards a far greater embrace of relativism and a far more common denial of objective truth or, or objective truths. And, and, and yet in the academy, it has been there for the greater part of 120 years. And, and it, it, it needs to be traced out. And, and you actually do a, a marvelous job of that. But the, the point I want to make is, is that the average person with looking uh, at America's a thought class would think that it had always been this way when actually the country began with a very different uh, set of ideas and is premised upon a very different set of ideas. 
Right. And they were accessible to ordinary people. No. Um, what did all men are created equal be? That no man was by nature the rule of other men in the way that God was by nature the rule of men. And men were by nature the ruler of horses and dogs. If you told an average man today, why aren't we signing labor contracts without horses and dogs? He'd be befuddled by the question. Because yeah. he'd understand there's only one kind of creature can, you can make a contract. Some, only one kind of creature who would understand what it means to make a promise, make a commitment, and respect that commitment, even when it runs counter to his interest. Well, the people at the founding understood that. No man was by nature of other men, the way that God was by nature of men, they were by nature of dogs and horses. And Jefferson said in that famous line, whoever denied that had to assume that the mass of mankind were born with saddles on their backs and the privileged few were born with spurs on, ready to ride them. There's nothing mystical. It's, it's only in our own time that people, you know, my, my point is the theory classes. I've appealed here to Thomas Reed and those precepts of common sense that the ordinary man has to know. He still knows them. Yes. Um, the, he has to know them before he can start trafficking in theories. And what you've got is a vast theory class. People have just spent a life absorbing theories. They can't see any longer, but the ordinary person uh, can readily see. Can I give an example of, of the, the um, let's say, uh, the transgender case with Gorsuch uh, writing on the Harris case. If it comes to the judgment that if Anthony Stevens earnestly believes he's a woman, to deny that is to engage in sexual discrimination, discrimination based of sex is not in the, in the Civil Rights Act. And therefore, anyone who refuses to respect that claim uh, would, would put himself in peril, himself and his employer for constituting a hostile work environment, right? Now, uh, the, the, the conservatives hear this and say, well, uh, that's not the way it was understood in 1964. That's not what people made of it. But I said, when, when, people, when they do that, we know it was going to, the play was going to be. They're going to invoke the old Lyman Trumbull card from 1868, where Lyman Trumbull had to assure his colleagues up and down that nothing in this new 14th Amendment was going to challenge those laws in Illinois, as well as Virginia, that barred marriage across racial lines. And he knew that if he couldn't get that assurance, that 14th Amendment didn't have a chance of passing. So now people come back and say, but look, Lyman Trumbull didn't understand the full implications of his own principles. And after all, the life of moral experience is a life of discovering in the cases of our own principle that if heretofore gone unnoticed. So what we're going to hear is you, we have a more amplified view of the meaning of discrimination based sex we had to, at that moment. The only move that you could make is not to the text, not to right. the dictionaries, right. but to what sex is. So the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith once said, there's not always been an Italy there's not always been a hunger, but as long as there are human beings, there must be males and females. That's something that's right. we can invoke Genesis, but that is how we are constituted. That is the telos, the purpose of sexuality. So now we have the situation. Uh, Stephen says he's earnestly become a woman. As soon as he walks into a locker room, any ordinary man could see what is specious about that. So here's the trick. That's a very gentle way to put it. What is specious about that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, here's the, so here's the, the combination. How much training, how many years spent in absorbing theories of statutory construct can lead an accomplished lawyer to offer in a portentous way a judgment that any ordinary man could see as ludicrous? Right. Okay, right. so you say, this is exactly the sharpest tension we have before, you know, you, know, you saw my line with from Jefferson saying, we could give a moral problem to a professor and a plowman, and the plowman is as apt to get it right because he's not going to be distracted by artificial theories. They, they call them theories, you know. Yes. Absolutely. You, no, you're absolutely right. You have a, an elite, the, the advantages of higher education have talked themselves into all kinds of esoteric theories, which make no sense to the right. ordinary man. And we used to say, I used to say, nobody is a relativist where he lives. 
So, Absolutely. No one's a relativist, even someone like uh, Richard Dawkins said, at 33,000 feet. <laughs> <laughs> you believe in fixed laws at uh, 33,000 feet. Well, the Big Bang came in, didn't it? And it brought a lot of things in. But, right. Well, you know, we are living in, in the, the world of theory. And, and, uh, and, and we think that debate, many people think the debate is quite modern. But, you know, for instance, if you look at Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., I mean, he, he basically is already critiquing the ac academic world as being the world of theories. What he puts in place is an even worse theory. Right? Yeah. He says, right. The, the purpose is to purge all words of moral significance from the law altogether. Yes, and, and, and he's been stunningly successful. I'm afraid so. It's amazing, yeah. stunningly successful, you know, that um, if you ask him, on what ground is the majority rule the minority? Because the majority can overpower the minority. Right. Which is the, the rule of the strong, I think. And that is offered to us by one of the premier jurists, uh, jurists in the country. Are we find yes. Somebody? Yep. And and more more on that in just a moment. I I, I kind of want to throw the, uh, the 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 meat on the grill here for a moment and say that uh, the 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 unique contribution made by Professor Hadley Arcus has to do with a critique not only of the theories of the left but the theories of the right, and right. in particular when it comes to jurisprudence, the Supreme Court, the Constitution. Um, you argue that it was a uh, it was a false move for conservatives to grasp upon the theory of originalism or textualism, as it was sometimes known. Uh, and uh, that, that's where I want to center some of our conversation today. And let me just say up front, I'm, I'm proud to be the recipient, a recipient of the Edwin Meese Award for originalism. Ed, Ed, Edward Meese, Ed Meese is a yes. great friend of mine. And He's a great man. And, yes. And a, and a yes. great teacher. A yes. Great, okay. But I'm also a theologian, so I operate on the basis of a prior ontology before I get to how to read a text. But uh, your critique in this book, in fact, the subtitle is Originalism and the Anchoring Truths of the Constitution. You actually point to one of the problems of conservative thought, and especially the last half of the 20th century, and that was trying to argue that we can anchor conservative principles uh, in an original meaning of the text, not with reference to anything, in, in fact, foregoing reference to anything behind it. In other words, foregoing claims of yeah. enduring moral, and I, I would say ontological truth, and instead yeah. arguing that this is a proper means of interpretation. So just to cut to the quick, I'm going to argue that they're not wrong on the question of interpretation. They're wrong on the question of whether or not there must be ontological truth behind it. Well, as an old colleague of mine used to say, we're in heated agree we're in heated agreement. Uh, the, the problem I I had a satisfying and gratifying career teaching the American founding. Yes, and understand if you want to understand what the Constitution is about, the best way place to look are those remarkable men who gave us the most luminous account. The mistake in originalism is that people detached the Constitution from the moral ground and those principles right. that the founders were drawing upon before they made the Constitution. And they realized they'd have to appeal outside the text quite often in order to ex explain how this thing, how this text bears on cases before them. And, and, and so we get this curious notion. It's, it, people are so reacting to um, the Warren Court and the invention of new rights and abortion, for example. But they, they didn't want to touch the moral ground of it. They simply say the crime was that abortion is not mentioned in the Constitution, and therefore a federal judge didn't have any ground on which to articulate rights that were emanate from right. the Constitution. Well, marriage wasn't mentioned in the Constitution when right. the court struck down those laws. That is not the point. As Jerry Bradley pointed out, the, the federal government had ample reason to be dealing with abortion before Roe versus Wade. It had to deal with abortion in military outposts, diplomatic outposts, the territories, the District of Columbia. The mistake was saying, the real mistake was, in Roe versus Wade, those lawyers from Texas brought in an exquisite brief value, you may remember, drawing on the most updated findings of embryology to point out that offspring in the womb 
It has never been anything but human from its first moment. It has never been a merely a part of the mother's body. That's right. The ground was the problem with the abor- abortion. They're told it not is not because abortion was not the text, because but it was the most indefensible and plausible reasoning that to, to say that we know nothing about the state of that 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 offspring in the womb. That we're after all these years of embryology, we know nothing. It's simply a value judgment to be put out there. Yes. That is, a, it was a substantive mistake. That's the difference with that. So they, they say, okay, you've cured the problem. You simply say it's not in the Constitution. But, you know, we see Roe versus Wade did not really establish the right to abortion. It changed the culture. It converted abortion from being something abhorred, discouraged, forbidden, into something uh, approved, encouraged, celebrated, promoted. Right. With the support of the state. Yeah, that's so. Mm-hmm. But all some of our friends are thinking. You see, we slew that that oh, we slew that that white whale. We, we knocked uh, right, but we didn't do anything to touch the very moral ground, the moral teaching of that decision, so that the current majority would not even get itself to state that that offspring of the womb is indeed a human being with right. the claims and protection of the law. And that would have made a profound difference for the way in which that matter was sent back to the states. Or the way it's handled now. To may, the- may I make an argument? I want to see how you respond to it. Okay. Uh, because you really don't get into the politics so much. And I, I appreciate that's that's not your project here. You're you're dealing with the jurisprudence. I actually think that's more important, but the politics is important in terms of getting uh oh I thought I thought he I thought he did have it in there. I thought it was yeah. I thought it was the subtext or I mean through the page. But, no, it but, is the subtext. I want to bring it to the I want to bring it to the text for a moment. Okay, fine. And, and let, so let me make two arguments if I may. Number one, conservatives in the uh in the nineteen seventies in particular and, and into the eighties, uh, came to a couple of conclusions. Well, one was that uh that the law schools were primarily given to this uh, formalism and uh basically an understanding of the law that was if if uh, yeah, you might say at very best merely based in pragmatism, at worst based in, you know, liberationist theory. And so they were looking for some conservative argument, and there really wasn't one in the law schools. There just really wasn't much of, a, of an argument. It's, it's true. It's true. So they, they had to invent what they saw as a conservative argument. The second thing is um, they were very offended by what they saw. And I think this is this is not wrong. They were right when they said, well, OK, where did the court go off the rails? And they weren't wrong that the court went off the rails. In, uh, in, in uh, again, assuming this kind of uh, evolving constitution or living constitution, kind of a Hegelianism brought into constitutional interpretation, they weren't wrong that that was wrong. They also weren't wrong that in the 1950s, the Supreme Court was bringing in information outside of the proper domain of the law and, and, and using it in making their decisions. Uh, sociology, for instance, uh, criminology, any number of other disciplines. And so originalism was an effort to try to create a conservative argument where there had not been one. And I'm with you to say, I think it was really important, but it's not enough because when it denied a moral meaning prior to the law, it it basically cut itself off from, uh, from a a far more lasting and uh, objectively true claim. But I do, I do want to say it's understandable in intellectual history that originalism has had such a dramatic effect upon the Supreme Court. But you remind me of something else. There was a conservative jurisprudence on the court. It's a jurisprudence of natural rights. But it wasn't present on the court at that time. It wasn't what? It was not represented on the Supreme Court at that time. I did a book about George Sutherland. About Uh, who? George Sutherland. Justice Sutherland. Yes. No, no I, I'm, I mean in the 1950s, excuse me. Okay, but the point is, what happened? Yeah. What happened yes. along the way was progressivism. Absolutely. And, and the court talked themselves into the notion that those cases, striking down the minimum wage for women, a right. brilliant, compelling case, or the Lochner case um, with men work extra hours in the bakery, he struck, they struck them down, and now... The, the, the conservative judges have come behind and say, no, we're not backward reactionaries like those natural rights judges in the earth. We are going to say, yes, you can use the, the law for the sake of, yeah, we may not agree with it. As Scalia would say, the minimum wage laws are just a wacky idea, but there's nothing unconstitutional about them. So they're beginning to sign on and accept all the scheme 
the scheme of yes. the New Deal. And as you say, by the time we got to Brown versus Board, you know, uh, and social segregation, um, you know, we used to raise the question, if you separate the kids on the base of race and the reading scores go up, has the segregation ceased to be wrong? Or is it wrong in principle? And you mean because of the kind of argument they used, the argument that was merely in terms of sociological effect. You're saying it should have been a moral judgment. Yeah, so they offered the uh, Kenneth Clark's dolls about children rejecting their blackness. And so the problem was that the blackness was rejected more often um, in the integrated settings rather than segregated settings. So first I'll tell you, we don't know what the principle is. We know there's nothing in the text about this because we know that Congress had passed out that 14th Amendment did not interfere with racially segregated schools in the District of Columbia. It's hard to believe that they didn't think the 14th Amendment could reach the schools of D.C., that somehow it reached the schools of Topeka. So it's not it's not in the text. It's not in the understanding of the framers. We're not going to make an argument of principle. We're simply going to cite the social, the, 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 the social science. But when the social science comes out the wrong way, we said, we'll tell you, we'll tell you what it means. Well, and we see that right now in terms of the uh, LGBTQ issues. We see the very same oh, thing. Absolutely. So we're absolutely detached from any serious cons- consultation of the evidence. It becomes some kind of a doc, like, like the whole homosexual life. It's, how did this become an orthodoxy that you couldn't simply call it? A, raise a question about it. How is this justified? Right. What, why can't I express an, a, an aversion to it? What is what, what's principle wrong with it? Yeah, you're right. The whole thing is, but you see, this is, the conservatives got them into this themselves. As you say, the natural law was being rejected on both sides. Yes. And the the, 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 the conservatives thought, we're just being a little more sophisticated and urbane and dealing with the law as we find it. It's, law is going to be used by um, majorities to, uh, to, uh, Try all kinds of progressive means, rent control, price controls, uh, sterilization. You know, right. Black Justice male. Holmes. And you take a look back in when they struck down the Skinner versus Oklahoma on sterilization. They still wanted to be good liberals, not challenging the authority of the majority. So they didn't want to dislodge Holmes and Buck versus Bill. They wanted to keep as much as possible the right of majorities to do all kinds of uh, and you know unseemly things because that's that's morally wrong democracy. things hmm? yes morally wrong things yeah they did, they didn't want to make that judgment yes they want to leave it remember Scalia said in the marriage cases I don't I don't want to discuss marriage itself I don't have he has no substantive argument to offer defense my concern is that the American people should not be ruled by five judges. Okay. It was only a matter of procedure, and the fact that it wasn't in the Constitution. You couldn't find same-sex marriage there, but n- but it was not rising to a defense of marriage as we know it. And that's right. been the, that has been the move of the, of the conservatives in, in our time. Ed, Ed, Ed Mace is a, a terrific guy. He know he knows uh, where the slight differences we have on this one, but he's a very He's a very wise man, and, and Ed's judgments are right almost all the time, I think. Well, when we speak about people like Edwin Meese, and uh, the attorney general uh, played a pivotal role in American history, by the way, uh, because I think a lot of conservatives fail to recognize uh, it took someone inside the Reagan administration to weave these things together in an argument that would be persuasive to Ronald Reagan, uh, and also to uh, uh, the, a, a majority of Republicans in the United States Senate, especially on the Committee on the Judiciary, in, in order to, to, to make headway here. And, uh, and, and he, he was not a man merely who was a political operative. He was a man of ideas. And uh, then I, um, I have tremendous admiration for someone who was your dear friend, and that is the late Justice Antonin Scalia. And you've mentioned him. Yeah, I know. But uh, I, very, I would— very, very dear to me, yes. I, I, I would frame the argument a bit differently because I'm in a different place. But I would, I would simply say that originalism is necessary but not enough. It is necessary but not sufficient. And uh, taken by itself— if originalism is all you've got, then all you have at the very, at the very most, is some kind of, uh, you know, delay in the inevitable progress of of uh, moral dissolution. Uh, all it does is 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 perhaps slow down an engine of uh, ideological progressivism 
because it just it just it just replaces ideologically progressive arguments with slower arguments. And so it's not enough. Uh, I and I, I appreciate the fact that you take it on. H- how has that played out in your academic life? In, in other words, where is the movement for what you're calling for in your most recent book, Mere Natural Law? I, I think, by the way, you're talking to someone who's a part of that movement. But nonetheless, where do you find it? The amazing thing was I was invited to start this project 11 years ago by Tom Klingenstein when he was president of the Klan. He said, I want you to change the legal culture. So I, I have a conservative view on the, the, the difficulty of doing something like that. But the remarkable thing, Al, is that the people have been coming over to our side of young lawyers, judges, and um, people are beginning to sense something is awry. Something has not been... You see the Bosna case and transgenderism? Yes. They have a sense something is missing. They're, as Chris DeMuth said in a in the commentary on my books, people are think there's something quite not right about a morally agnostic constitution. Right. Look, my, my other thing about the constitution is that you can put it this way. To be guided by the constitution is to bet. I'd rather be ruled by James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Marshall than by Harry Blackman, Neil Gorsuch. And, yeah, that's what the constitution, we have, we have more confidence in the minds that put that in place. So that's right. the that's the argument you have to beat. And if the Constitution talks about capital punishment, they all assume it's there, then you need a strong argument to explain what is wrong with it. Right. So there's no just yes, we do start with a high respect. And they had reasons for what they were doing, you know? And all those provisions are important. I think I do want to know whether uh, uh, a structure, a foreign power can use a state as a naval military base. Yeah, these are structural matters. I've got to know. These are important. These are not what we're litigating about, though. Um, so the real problem, again, was we do want the, we we esteem the Constitution. Uh, and part, what, what do people, might, well, we pride ourselves on in this project, Dale, is that we want to recall, recover to people the reasoning used by the judges instead of remembering the box score. Yes. And people remember the bot score. They don't remember the kinds of reasons that kept them. By the way, in this vein, though, in our project, we have these, in the summer, we have these accomplished young lawyers with newly minted degrees on their way to clerkships. And a couple of years ago, we had a first, a young woman who had clerked on the Supreme Court for John Roberts and Old Featherbot. And I said, my God, why are you here? She said, I want to get but I couldn't get at Harvard. And what's wow. the surprise? That's my surprise now. That is setting in. We're hearing more and more. We, are, we would give this opening to the class on Aristotle's power. And the way on which the Lincoln and the debate with Douglas really helped explain the moral argument in, in the politics. And I assume we did this. Look, I'm sure this is just a refresher for you guys. Turns out, no, it wasn't a refresher. They never heard it before, either in college no. or in law school. No. So, so these are the signs. I think we are recruiting some support for this, yes. uh, and which is sort of, uh, with, with my with my hopes. Well, I, I will say I'm, I'm the president of an academic institution with graduate and undergraduate programs, and I'll tell you, if you're looking for a pushback against the modern liberal culture, look to these young people. Because they're 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 coming by the thousands, and uh, they know exactly what they're coming for and what they expect. You, you the people you are seeing. Yes, I don't, exactly. I don't think those are the people at my former co- my college where I spent fifty years. Because that book, first things that course yes. came out of a course called political. I could not give that course again at Amherst College. So what would what would happen if you did? I'll be complaints right away that uh, yeah. women feel safe, unsafe in it. Uh, this this right. just runs counter to the deepest. Orthodoxies that this you possibly right. calling into question the right of a woman to order up an abortion. Right. It's just flagrantly out of line with everything we're doing here. It's yeah. a, it's, it's, it's despicable and it makes people feel unsafe. It's a totally transformative. Now, people in the past used to come into the course thinking, ah, there's an argument here. Can I break the argument? Can I test the argument? And people, you know, they carry the argument into the dormitories. Right. And they argued in, in the in the 
and the dining halls and in, in the dormitories. And people would say, oh, you were in this course last year. Do you know the argument? Yeah. So you realize there are a lot of people teaching for me then. Right. That couldn't, po- that couldn't possibly happen. That's, that's gone. Right. Well, and that's why we have uh, such a deep divide in this country. It's a divide in academia, and it's growing, it's growing wider by the day. Uh, I, I want to come back for a moment to uh, say, um, uh, let's, uh, let, let's go to a, a Burgerfell rather than Bostock. Uh, oh, oh, okay, right. Yeah, okay, so Antonin Scalia's dissent is, I would argue, an absolutely brilliant display of literary and logical skill. It's a, it's a devastating argument. The problem is he never says anything ontological about marriage. Of course. In other words, he's he is at he there is no one so incisive as was he in pointing out the errors in the progressivist argument. The problem is that the Supreme Court, even on the conservative side, has tried its very best not to say what marriage is. Now I'm I'm headed somewhere here. I want to test a theory with you, and that is that L and G and B and T are not equally uh, products or, or uh, 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 sources of disequilibrium. I think the T is unique. And so, you know, it's one thing if the court doesn't know what marriage is. It's another thing if the court doesn't know who a boy and, and who a girl is. It's part of the same scheme, though. It's, it's, it's just the scheme yes. working itself out. It's that utterly deta- utter detachment from the truths of nature. But this yeah. one's not, oh, absolutely. But this is not going to work. It, it's, it's not going to work. I, I trace this e- even in an article that appeared in the Wall Street Journal yesterday. It can't keep the language straight. And so over here, it basically wants to say, you know, uh, whoever, uh, and this was this was about a you know controversy having to do with uh, you know the the Bud Light transgender controversy. I didn't see that, didn't see that piece in the journal yesterday. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. It was your piece. That's your piece. No, no, no. I, it's oh. it's a piece I'm critiquing in oh, this case. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. It, it's it's a piece I'm critiquing. It was an investigative report. It began on the front page in the print edition. And, and so it, it's arguing, and clearly it's trying to keep the transgender language, but it gets to who is actually, who, who, the, uh, who, who the advertising camp, uh, who the a- average buyer of, I can't believe this, I'm thinking in public, you got a Southern Baptist talking about Bud Light, but that, that's the controversy of the day. And so this is the average consumer is a male. Well, you just said you didn't know who a male was, but now if you're trying to sell this product, you do know who a male is. You, well, can't, you can't keep coherence here. Yeah, if you're trying to talk about going from male to female, you have to assume those coordinates <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> must be in place. <laughs> you know, it's uh, as, as look, uh, David David uh, Crawford and uh, Margaret uh, McCarthy point out, it's it's a it's a new metaphysic. What is what is the youngster learn? Does he say when he, he's told his father could be a woman, his mother could be a guy? His sister could be a guy. How does he not be so impelled to think, what am I? What right. am I? Now? Right. You know, How do I with, know? Yeah. With the thing with Scalia, by the way, I was in the courtroom that day and I was sitting with Mrs. Scalia uh, when Nino read that opinion. And when we walked out, I said to her, you know, Maureen, if Nino had read that opinion, we couldn't be walking upright out of this room right now. He had to be sent. But at the same time, you say, right, it was never an argument about what must marriage be? What is there about the capacity of moral creatures to make a commitment that conveys their foregoing their freedom to leave one another and the children as it suits their convenience, and the children begotten from that union represent the one flesh human institution instantiated. I remember seeing years ago, my my younger son Jeremy had a a, a a swing in Georgetown, and I suddenly saw reflections of my mother's parents that he never could know. I said, "My God, he is really the marker of a love that existed a long time ago." Yes. Somehow you just have to pass by everything that is so precious and powerful in this in the natural understanding, and it's part of our nature too. Yes. That is a commitment confirmed by law because we are the one creatures who can say, and, you know, one interesting thing we get, but I don't get different reactions these days. Some of my students would say, oh, this matter of sexual attraction, it's just wholly subjective. 
And I said, all right, let's try it this way. I married her for her exquisite blondness. She went perfectly with the drapes in my apartment. <laughs> but now I'm doing the place over in Art Deco, don't you see? And, and it used to elicit giggles. But the point is, do you see, that's trivializing marriage. What part is it missing? This is the fact you're joined to this spouse because you see something so admirable about that character. Something so admirable, morally important, that it's not going to wither with age. See, you're missing that component of it. And it's just, uh, how people just flip back past all these things as though it just did, did, it didn't make a dent, you know? Well, uh, yes. And, and by the way, I uh, was in a conversation just recently with the official biographer, uh, well, I should say the most recent biographer with access of Antonin Scalia. And uh, he James says, Rosen. James Rosen, he's quite yeah. terrific. Yeah, we just we just had a conversation, and in it he says that it was Mrs. Scalia who uh, convinced uh, or argued with Justice Scalia that he must read that dissent aloud. So, if true, I'm thankful I, I, to her I, for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's true. I think Maureen told him that you really should read, read it aloud. She, yes, she, she was right. Yeah. Well, yeah. it was an act of bravery. Uh, it, we're someone to a lot of acts of bravery these days. It's a, uh, I mean, just just to assert natural law. So now, now I, I want to turn this just a little bit and say, so here's yeah. another irony. I am speaking to a famous convert to Roman Catholicism. Okay. And I am a confessional Protestant, even a Southern Baptist, and we're having a conversation about the natural law. Right. You understand the irony in that, because there'd be a lot of people who would say, what in the world do these two men have to talk about when it comes to natural law? But that is to misunderstand uh, both the nature of the natural law and, uh, I would argue, uh, uh, the the claims uh, relative to the Roman Catholic Church and to Protestantism. So I'm just arguing that there, there really is a great deal of common ground, but there is also a great deal of difference in how a Protestant and a Roman Catholic would talk about the natural law. So let's talk about both. Okay, well, first of all, we know it's, um, what does Paul say in Romans? Those Gentiles who have not the law, when they do by nature the things of the law, they are as right. the law to themselves, right? And Aquinas said, Aquinas said um, the divine law we know through revelation, but the natural law we know through that reasoning that is accessible to human beings as human beings. I just, I, just, actually, I just came across, I was just looking through Augustine the other day, book 19, he said, yes. uh, it may be easier to explain this to you if I don't appeal to faith, but use that reasoning that everyone understands. And John Paul II said, when 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 uh, St. Paul went out to, out to Athens, uh, he thought he had to use the language that other, other people would understand. Okay, so th- that's the... Uh, and so put the Catholic position on abortion example is simply principle reasoning combined with with uh, uh, with with embryology. So they say you you don't you don't need to be Catholic to understand this. That's been the position. So when Bishop Lori uh, made his argument against Obamacare, he wasn't he wasn't asking for an exemption for Catholics. He's saying this is a wrong law. Now I'm I'm not quite sure I've mastered. What all the discomfort is among among um, among my Protestant friends? This because well, where does this all come from? Well, we know where it comes from. Uh, we, we know we get creatures of reason. Yes. It came from the Creator who endowed us with the Word and with with reason. Um, and of course, and the whole thing comes along with the fact. How do you? How does this? Uh, you help me here too, Al. You fill in for me. How? Why does this this biped who conjugates verbs? Why is a bearer a bearer of rights? And Lincoln would say, "No one made in the graven image was sent into this world to be imbruted." No, or that line, you know that line you've heard me use from um, in, in critique of my friends at Amherst. That yeah. time when I was doing that um, piece on the Holocaust Museum for Natural Review, I took the Turner turn and found the vast vat filled with shoes. Yes. And the things the Nazis thought they could use again. And what came back were Justice McLean's searing lines yes. in the uh, Dred Scott case. You may think that black man is chattel, 
but he's a creature made in the impress of his maker. He's amenable to the laws of God and man, and he is destined to an endless existence. He has a soul that will not decompose. Now I say, you get to measure the situation, realize the Nazis looked at this scene, they thought the shoes were the durable. Yes, that's such, and, a, such an important point. And, and, and so I just say, my colleagues in the academy, they have people of large liberal studies, but they have to realize they can't give the same account of the wrong of genocide right. and slavery that we can give out of our religious tradition. So, yeah, we can do this for reason, but at the same time, we know you can't do this all with a syllogism. Something right. else must be in place. So after yeah. that, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to be tutored, as we say, about where, where my, my Protestant friends have their difficulty with it. Well, uh, first of all, there is a uh, there, there, there's a, there's a, a kind of a long history here, and uh, longer than most Protestants recognize. And so, if I go back to the 16th century, with the magisterial reformers Luther and Calvin, right, neither of them denied the natural law. Right, right. right Both right. of them affirmed it. Uh, with Luther, it was creation order, or the orders of creation, to use his his exact term translated, the orders of creation. And uh, for Calvin, uh, it was uh, God's revelation in nature uh, of things that are knowable to all based simply upon the Imago Dei uh, inferences drawn. And and so there's a there there there, there, there is there is a, a again it's it's very similar to Luther in creation order. But for Calvin, it was more it was more systematized. Where the reformers differed from the Catholic Church in the 16th century, and even more emphatically the heirs of both, because you know in the post-Reformation era they're defining themselves against one another, yeah. is in the knowability of these things, and that's where the reformers and the Protestants would come back and say, you know, the problem is, as Paul makes clear in Romans chapter one, that the sinner simply will not acknowledge what is there. It it it, it is there. Will will simply in, instead corrupts. Uh, that which is there, and uh, and lives by a lie, exchanges the truth of God for a lie. Uh, now, that's not absolutely extensive. So in other words, the, the Calvin and Luther would not say, therefore, we don't know what marriage is, but they would say, we actually need the special revelation of God in Scripture to make clear how the church is to order marriage. Both of them would have said, there's plenty in nature to tell the magistrate how to order marriage. Um. So I mean that, that so and, and you know the Catholic notion of concupiscence is is, is just rejected by Protestants. I'm, I'm 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 very much a Protestant. You figure that out. But what is happening right now among especially younger evangelicals, younger conservative thinkers, is a, a new realization of the fact that many arguments uh, from the natural law uh, are uh, let's put it this way ought to be at least very helpful to the church in understanding how to address these issues and understand them more deeply. Less confident are Protestants in how compelling these arguments will be in the larger culture. Well, see, I thought part of the concern of the past was that there were people are fearful thinking you could learn this simply by reading from the text instead of being guided by, by the Bible, right? So that, that, that could be it. But even so, um, you find that, uh, yeah, first, first, first of all, the fact that you can find some places where the, where the natives don't recognize the law of contradiction doesn't give us grounds to doubt the law of contradiction. We're dealing with strange people. Of course, there'd be sinners and people. As, as Reed says, if a guy thinks he's made of glass, there's nothing you're going to do with him. And that the, the sinners, we find other ways of loving the sinners without saying, no, we, we can't use that as a way of dissolving what we know. But I think you'll find, uh, actually, the quite interesting character is, is Bilamakli, Jean-Jacques Bilamakli, who was read by uh, James Wilson, who was a, 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 a Huguenot, Protestant. And he said, you know, people say there are two sources of law. One, it emanates from a lawgiver. The second, it's accordant. It's accordant with reason. And he said, our confidence that it emanates from a lawgiver is strengthened. We see that it's in accord with reason. So, you know, the line I always use, let's say, you have the biblical injunction, honor thy father and thy mother. I said, but it can't be referring simply to the biological father, because in that case, we'd be enjoined to honor the man who sired us in the course of a rape. It must, there must be a moral framework. That it must be referring to the father who fulfilled the moral definitions of parenting, 
the one who is there to protect and nourish. And my sense is that so many places we say we, we, we're assuming in, in the Bible, the moral, mean, moral, moral reasoning is there. And we may forget that we, it's all tucked away in our souls. We're always, it's always there for us to be used. We forget what, you know, and I used to say something, if Moses came down from the mount and said, the Lord our God told us, don't worry overly much about lying down with somebody else's wife or taking what is not yours. My hunch is the Hebrews gather ground and start scratching their heads and say, are you sure you got that one right? No. Yeah. Um, well, so, so uh, my, uh, you know, uh, there, there is a reason why so many young evangelicals are walking around with copies of uh, Mere Natural Law. Are they, are they really? They, they, are, they are. Really? They are. And uh, I mean to encourage you. But it is because, uh, it, it, well, let me put it this way, I put it negatively first. It's not because uh, of a, a new confidence in human reason. It is, uh, you know, out there in the, the, the larger polis. It is instead an understanding of the fact that uh, Protestantism has often built arguments that, uh, that do not follow through in terms of, of, of application and and, and frankly, we're insufficiently grounded in ontology. I guess that's that's the bigger issue. Just weren't, weren't grounded in uh, uh, claims of an ontological status. And, and now, again, I'm just going to argue the T in LGBT is the culminating, you know, catalyst to require an awful lot of evangelicals to say, well, okay, you know, guess what? We're going to talk ontology. If we're talking ontology, we're talking certain categories. And those are categories that are ordered by reason. And, uh, and, and, but, but the, the reason is we have to go further and say any rational creature, that means human, in any member of Homo sapiens is accountable to this, cannot, you know, not know this, as Jay Budachevsky says. And, and so that's a, that's a new argument found among evangelical Protestants. Really? really? Yes. I thought, I thought the ontology is always taken for granted before we've got to know what is. What, well, taking for granted is, is the problem. You can take it for granted when the world around you commonly takes it for granted, but when the world around you is at war with it, you can't take it for granted anymore. That's charming. That's charming. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you're right. People, this is where sometimes people are shaken and people are saying, I thought I was liberal. I'm not, I'm not that far left, you know. They right. see something that, that, that goes beyond anything. But then they're trying to understand why they're justified in holding those things. You mean there really are these truths? Like what? How do I know them? You know? Um, so it becomes it becomes the opening. It becomes the opening yes. for us. And you know, you know, you know, my vibe, it's all I think in the book, it's like Plato's Mino when Socrates is feeding these young boy these questions, and he's step by step he's working out geometry. And and he says, it, it's it's unlocked within us. It's just a matter of the questions that bring them. I think there's so much of that true. That's true. Well, yes. They raise these questions. Say, Why are you signing labor contracts with dogs and horses? And the ordinary man realizes, you know, what he 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 grasps, but he doesn't never realize he knows. You know, I used to say the ordinary man knows it's not always wrong to take an alcohol drink. It depends on matters of degree, access. The same man will not turn around and say, well, how genocide if taken in moderation in small doses. He doesn't have the label, doesn't have the, the candle. Right. He doesn't talk about these contingent, they're right or wrong. But he has a sense of certain wrongs that will not be effaced by matters of degree. You know, I'm counting, as you are, on a natural understanding. Yes. Look at, which is why we think Outside of the theory classes, among ordinary people, we can find our constituents here. But apparently you've done better than that. Probably for your account, you've got students with you who really just yes. in with a concern about what is there, what really is anchoring everything. Uh, and, absolutely. And, and they have been forced into that position by circumstances. Ah. Uh, uh, and I, I yeah. think the, uh, the moral disequilibrium of the age has required them. I mean, fr frankly, if you're going to be 20 years old and you are not going to live by the code of, uh, you know, student sexual conduct at Duke, uh, but you're going to hold, you're going to hold to a, 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 a far more restrictive biblical conception. You've got to have a, you've got to have an argument. You've got, you, you, you've got to have an argument, not just based in theory, but based in the fact you actually believe there is one sovereign creator, just and righteous God who created us in his image 
And, uh, and not only has commanded us with law, but has also commanded our telos. That, that's something else you just haven't heard much um, from, from evangelicals is teleology. And teleology is the other side of the ontology. I think we're going to need some kind of great awakening to get. Let me take a let me take a riveting passage from your book that I think was at least you talk about homeschooling in Britain. Yes. Raise, start raising the question now. Are you homeschooling in such a way that you're fostering homophobia and all else? They realize they're after us. Right. Once this stuff has acquired the fact that they cannot be questioned, they're going to obliterate any any possibility of of having access to arguments against it. It's overwhelming. And I said, where is the ground of resistance to all of this? It's so massive. The woke corporations, as you point out, yes. uh, the media all around us. And some, I think we need a great awakening, something, oh, maybe a great awakening to get us back. But still, it's going to have to start with something. And maybe it starts, as you say, where people are just, just shocked by this and say, it's just, it's so implausible. It's so shocking in case of what is true. But, but then look, look what's happened yes. in the colleges. As people have obl obliterated for students any concern about what is true, it's your truth. It's a truth that works. We, we can live very happy lives by going along with the ethics that have been established over here. But see, Professor, they can't live with that. They, they, yeah. they say everyone has this truth. She has hers, you have yours. But increasingly, only this one's acceptable. Nothing else can even be articulated on the campus. That's why you may be the leader of the revolution now. You may, you, what you're doing there is where we build. Uh, we can't do it anymore at schools like Amherst or, or the other schools in the East. It's, but you can do it through some think tanks and uh, intellectual well, agencies, true, such as what you're doing with lawyers. Yeah, but we need yes. colleges. We need we yeah. do it with some yeah. Christian colleges who can do it. Where the real intellectual honesty and, and diversity comes in, in the Christian colleges. They can they they're not unhinged by peeling doing with people who who had are at odds with them. They're not they're not astonished by fallen creatures, you know. Right. Uh, right. and so on. And they could live with it. And um right now it, 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 that's those are the best resource we have. Unless if they can keep them, unless that's there's a move to strangle these colleges by saying uh that's right. we will accreditation unless you're gonna have pay provisions for um medical insurance for same-sex couples and and everything else like that and find other ways of um, of making life hard for you, you know? yes well we have tried to reduce the ways they can make life hard for us by for instance uh n not uh, uh, being involved in any form of uh, government supported uh financial aid uh, there, there there's no tax dependency here that's great that's that, that that's a start you know, as you say, through accreditors and through state regulators and the administrative state, they're going to try to find ways to come at us. And as you know, they can come at us through third parties. They can just make it such that uh, insurers okay. don't want to insure okay. us and, you know, okay. you know, contractors don't want to build for us. But, uh, you know, where, where do you place this? It's finally here. And I, I, I want to continue this conversation and hope to do so in person. But but where, where do you place this right now in kind of a timeline of history? And I'm not asking you to be a prophet, but you, but we're already seeing, at least intellectually, how the left's arguments are taking shape. Uh, what are we going to be talking about the next time we talk? Well, it struck me this morning that suddenly we are waking up in, into a dystopian novel. I mean, yes, I see businesses closing in Washington because signs up that the crime is too much. Uh, we find flash mobs going and destroying businesses in, in Chicago, Michigan Boulevard, and the notion that, that the law cannot be enforced. And under under a scheme of racism, we've created a situation where, where black kids don't get prosecuted um, and things like this. This it, It's going to render life here in, in Washington, D.C. really notably unsafe. And yes. I wonder where people are going to go. They're going to have to find enclaves in Louisville and Kentucky, in Florida, and yes. the country. It's I've never, I never thought I'd wake up in a country where a legislature could forbid parents from seeking counsel for a youngster who's undergoing confusion about his yes. sexuality. So I never thought I'd live in a country like that. I said, where did this come from, and what is it going to take? to start chipping away at it, to start breaking away from it, starting to call it into question. You know, you know, 
there's a great cartoon in the New Yorker years ago. Two guys <laughs> strapped to the wall, feet above their uh, scrub, scrub the, strapped to the wall. One turns to the other and says, I've got a plan. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> that's our people. That's our people. That's we're right. All, we're all going to climb. That's right. It's got to be a plan. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, Professor Arcus, I have to tell you, this uh, this conversation has been a tremendous privilege, and I do look forward to continuing it's it. So I've had a come come to DC, spend some time with me over here. Al. Oh, I would very much like to be there, and uh, I have a daughter and son in law and uh, three grandchildren oh. in Washington, so that makes it uh, that makes it an instant draw. So, uh, uh, so I, I, I wow, I'll have, to, I'll have to take a run to Louisville. I've got to, I got to run down there. It's we're, we're, we're going to arrange that as soon as we can. Uh, well, Professor Hadley Arcus, thank you for joining me for Thinking in Public. And Reverend Miller, it's just an honor to be with you, Al. It's, thanks so much for inviting me. In. Absolutely. You. Many thanks to my guest, Hadley Arcus, for thinking with me today. If you enjoyed today's episode of Thinking in Public, You can find more than 180 of these conversations at albertmuller.com under the tab Thinking in Public. For more information on the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, go to sbts.edu. For information on Boyce College, just go to boycecollege.com. Thank you for joining me for Thinking in Public. And until next time, keep thinking.